In investing, the concept of futures becomes relevant, a future being a uh, contract to specify a price for uh, purchase or sale at some time in the future. And I should note that there is now a contract on something that literally does not exist, and that is the weather. But in any case, a seller would like to avoid a price fall, liking a price rise. The buyer would hate a price rise and would like a price fall. And both of them would like to avoid the loss more than they would like to achieve the gain. Well, uh, one might hope that expected value would be useful in uh, future unknown pricing. And indeed, uh, let's see, we have a future value here of, let's say, 50, 100% of the time. Uh, that's worth 50, uh, maybe 50% of the time, a gain or a loss of uh, 10 bucks from that base. Uh, we get 60 or 40 half the time, that's worth 50. And maybe 80% of the time we gain 10, get a payoff of 60 and 20% of the time we lose 40 from the base of 50 and get only 10 and that adds up to an expected value of 50 and most people would probably prefer A over B and more even likely people would prefer B over C because of that profound loss well let's not stop there let's look at standard deviation variance uh, D has a 50% chance of a gain of 3 and likewise for loss of 3. Uh, e, 10% of the time you make 9 and 90% of the time you lose 1. Again, the same expected value of 0. And uh, F is just the reverse of E. And each of them have an expected value of 0. And we might resolve this, one might think, with standard deviation. And to the assiduous amongst you, you might uh, figure the variance out, and it turns out to be 9 for each of these, a standard deviation of 3. And yet most people would prefer the chance of the gain of 9 and a small loss of 1, it's E. And uh, certainly most people would avoid F, a chance of a large loss and only a small gain. Or consider the dreidel gain. Uh, you figure out the expected values, and as long as there's a shekel in there, it's worth a shekel to play. Well, before getting too far astray, I'd like to take up the case of foreign exchange and foreign exchange futures. There's other commodity contracts, and I should note that each of them have their own specifics, and that there is a spot price, a current price, and a futures price, and that the two eventually converge by a mechanism with which each day the contracts are repriced to the market so that any gain to a buyer uh, they uh, receive a payment and the other side of that is paid by the person who lost on that contract. Well, here's a stylized cross rate table. Uh, the currencies are converted from any of them listed to each other and uh, the horizontal row shows the uh, international coding for money, for credit cards, for uh, sending uh, wire transfers. First two letters are the ISO codes for a country, and the third letter designates the currency. Here's an example of why they do that. Uh, above and below you find respectively the old and uh, new uh, Turkish money, the upper one being the lira, the new one being the new one, the Turkish word yeni meaning new, and so the upper one was coded TRL, Turkish Lira, and the bottom one was coded TRY. Uh, how does foreign exchange affect the markets? Well, it depends. Uh, let's start on the left hand side where the foreign currency per dollar, let's say, rises, which means to say the dollar per foreign currency falls. And on the right side, we have the reverse. And uh, let's see, uh, foreign currency per dollar rising would uh, help importers, uh, people traveling abroad. Uh, foreign firms who are international, we'll make that clearer in a moment, and uh, you'd probably want to keep your monies in U.S. funds. Contrast that to the other side, where we have the foreign currency per dollar falling, the dollar rising per foreign currency, and here we're going to see the reverse. With the uh, dollar falling, uh, exporters uh, have a better time of it because uh, the foreign currency buys more dollars. 
uh, domestic uh, firms uh, competing against foreigners who are bringing in products to compete. Those foreign products are more expensive. Uh, U.S. firms uh, who have an international base are repatriating foreign monies. The foreign currencies are buying more dollars. And you probably want to be in foreign funds. Let's look at what's called the interest rate parity theorem, a relationship between interest rates and foreign currency values. There's something called the purchasing power parity theory, and most studies say it doesn't hold different labor rates, different uh, transportation rates, and so on. Well, let's see. I start at home, make a domestic return, which means it's converted in the future. My other path, maybe I'm going to meet a friend over there, converts their money now in the spot market and gets the foreign return. Let's set these equal to each other. And when we do, we uh, have an example here. And it's a dreaded word problem. A dollar currently buys 100 yen. That's in the spot market. A uh, Japanese uh, denominated return makes 4%. A uh, US uh, denominated return makes 12. And we want to know what should be the value of a 90 day price of a yen dollar future contract. Well, uh, 90 days is a quarter of a year. So that 12% becomes computationally 3. And the 4% uh, in Japan becomes computationally 1. And uh, we open two accounts and find out what exchange rate in the future sets them equal to each other. And it turns out to be 98 to 1. And uh, let's see if that's right. We made 2% more in one country than the other, so the currency should fall by 2%. And of course, we should note that foreign exchange is only one component to international diversification. One can uh, note that there are obviously foreign firms as such. And I've given you a list of the incorporating abbreviations uh, for foreign firms. And finally, let's note that there are something called ADRs, American Depository Receipts, Foreign Securities Trading Here.